Uh, hello, uh, welcome to, to a new virtual tour of the European Southern Observatory. Um, we are about to, to start now. Um, well, um, my name is Farid Char and with the producer Hector Torsalas, we are going to be your guides during this trip to ESO Paranal Observatory. Okay, so just a little bit uh, about me. I have more than 15 years of experience in astronomy outreach and education. And I am one of the guides of the observatory since uh, 2010. And I am also part of the staff of a center of astronomy in Antofagasta. So and regarding my personal hobbies, uh, well, I am interested in telescope observations and astrophotography. So ISO wants to be with you during these virtual visits and bring astronomy uh, directly to your home or wherever you are. So please remember, uh, you can send your questions and comments during all this streaming. So I can imagine you already have uh, some questions. So to do that, uh, you can leave your questions or comments uh, in the comment uh, section uh, of this uh, broadcast on Facebook or YouTube. Um, so uh, as I told you today, um, we have um, a, well, I, I, I will be your guide and, and Hector Salas uh, will be the producer. So Hector, uh, are you there? How are you today? Good morning. Everybody? Yeah, I, I can I can hear you now, Hector. How, uh, how are you? Me now? Uh, I'm very fine. Happy to be here with everybody and share Paranormal Observatory with you. I uh, will present myself a bit. I have a master's degree in astronomy and I started working in the tours in 2019 in February 2019. And at, by the end of the year, I will start a PhD in astronomy in Germany. So if you have any question, please ask, and don't forget to leave your comments in Facebook or YouTube. And I guess we are ready to start the tour for it. OK, uh, Hector, thank you. Thank you so much. So OK, so we are going to start with this tour. And in the fir in first place, uh, I want to help you to understand the place of uh, our visit. So we will um, begin with some uh, with some information uh, about uh, this this place, about the European Southern Observatory or ESO. So ESO is composed of sixteen uh, member states. Okay, so right now, uh, as you can see in in your screen, uh, we have the sixteen uh, member states. Okay, so. Um, uh, the headquarters of ESO are located in Germany. Okay? Uh, also, Australia has recently joined ESO as a strategic partner. Okay? Um, so, as you can see in, in, in this, in this uh, map. So, uh, in order to, to understand uh, what happens now, uh, from the 1960s and with those objectives uh, in mind, um, uh, with, with the objective of, of uh, have a um, uh, have a big, big observatory in the southern hemisphere. Okay, uh, Chile is the host state uh, uh, of this um, of all observatories of ESO, and um, uh, so so from from the 1960s, ESO has chosen one of the best places of the planet for astronomical observation. Okay, uh, the Atacama Desert in Chile. So during this period, uh, Chile started several site explorations in order to attract international observatories such as ESO to our country. So as a result, Chile offered its territory and ESO did choose the best uh, or the more suitable areas, okay? So in this case, uh, the mission of ESO is uh, to design, uh, build, and operate uh, astronomical observatories. Why? Well, to enable important scientific discoveries and incentivize the promotion and cooperation in the astronomy field, okay? So right now, um, we, we are going to see in the screen a picture with the three observation sites uh, of ESO uh, in Chile. So uh, as you can see here, uh, we have the Chagnator Plateau, site of the ALMA and APEX uh, radio telescopes. Uh, ESO is part of these uh, places for radio astronomy alongside other international partners. Additionally, uh, south of Atacama Desert, uh, at the 2,400 meters, we have La Silla Observatory in the Coquimbo region in Chile. So this ESO Observatory um, is the home of several telescopes, such as the NTT, 
or the 3.6 meter ISO telescope. And this one is using the HARPS instrument. Uh, and this is an exoplanet hunter. And uh, finally, uh, we have the place of our visit, the Paranal Observatory. This is observatory is the home of the Very Large Telescope, or VLT, the most advanced visible light telescope on the planet. Okay? So in the next few years, we will also um, have the Extremely Large Telescope, or ELT, the biggest visible light telescope on Earth. Okay? Also, uh, the CTA will be an array of telescopes focused on capturing gamma rays. Okay? Okay, so with all this information, uh, now we have a better picture of this uh, facility. So right now we are going to travel uh, to ESO Paranal Observatory. Okay, so we are going to okay, so we are going to, to do this. We are going to do a virtual trip. Uh, so right now we are virtually traveling, virtually flying over the Atacama Desert uh, in the north of Chile. Uh, about uh, 1,600 kilometers north of the capital, Santiago. Um, specifically, about uh, 130 kilometers south of Antofagasta, the regional capital, and about uh, 90 kilometers north of Taltal, uh, the closest city. So now we are going toward the mountain top of Cerro Paranal, located at 2,600 meters above sea uh, the sea level. This mountain belongs to the coastal range, and despite its altitude, it is located at just 12 kilometers from the coast. And where is the ocean? Well, the Pacific Ocean is located below this cloud cover. So why those clouds, if right here the sky is so clear, dry, and lonely? Well, this is because of the influence of the Humboldt Current. So this is a cold current near the coast of Chile and Peru cooling the atmosphere and causing a phenomenon called thermal inversion at about uh, 1,000 meters above sea level, keeping below the cold, humid, and basically bad air for astronomy. And above the layer, instead, we have the hot, dry, and less dense air. So this is the good air for astronomy. So the clouds are blocked by the coastal range, and near Paranal, uh, the mountains are high enough surpassing um, 2,000 meters uh, above sea level. So uh, at this point, can you tell me what other natural barriers we have in this area? Well, about 200 kilometers to the east, we have the Cordillera de los Andes with very high mountains, more than uh, 6,000 meters above sea level. And so this is another natural barrier blocking uh, clouds from Argentina and Bolivia. So the main result is this landscape, uh, a place with an average of more than 300 clear nights per year, with a very clear and transparent atmosphere, making it ideal for observing the night sky. Uh, also, here we, here we are uh, far away from artificial light sources because of human activity. I mean, uh, light pollution. So basically, this is one of the best places on Earth for astronomical observations. OK, so right now uh, we will change the view to have an even closer look to Paranal. OK, so um, as you can see now, uh, this is not an ordinary mountain. And now we can see the different telescopes and structures in the mountain. We are at the summit of Cerro Paranal. So do you know what Paranal means? Uh, well, in the Quechua language, Paranal means uh, whirlwind possibly because of some weird winds uh, forming in the desert. However, as I told you already, the atmosphere here is, is uh, extremely quiet. So this observatory is a true oasis. So you will see how in one of the driest deserts, uh, we have a lot of life and of course we have a lot of uh, science. Okay. okay, so right now um, we are going to visit the summit of Paranal. Okay, so... We have to go to the mountain top, and here we are. OK, so um, uh, from this position, uh, you can see uh, in front of us, we have the Very Large Telescope, or VLT. It's acronym. OK, so um, I am going to show you um, some details about this place. OK, and, and here you can see the amount of buildings. OK, we have four giant domes. 
and other four small and rounded ones. So we have, uh, for I mean, these are the big ones, and here we have the small ones. Okay, we have four small ones. Okay, so. Uh, regarding this uh, uh, the telescopes, okay, it is clear that the very large telescope, in fact, is not only one, but a very special array of telescopes. So all this facility is the most advanced optical observatory on Earth. Okay, so let's take a closer look. Um, here you can find the four unit telescopes. Okay. Uh, the, the big ones in your screens, okay? Each one with a primary mirror of 8.2 meters of diameter. So uh, the small ones, as I told you before, we have some small telescopes that, uh, here. Uh, the small ones uh, are the auxiliary telescopes, okay, or ATs. So each one with a primary mirror of 1.8 meters of diameter, okay? So this is the main difference. Now, uh, each UT, I mean each unit telescope, one of the big ones, okay, each uh, unit telescope has a name in Mapudungun language. This is the language of the Mapuche uh, people, uh, natives from the central or south of Chile. So um, in, in first place, we have Antu here, okay? Antu means uh, sun in Mapuche. Uh, the second one is Cuyen, and Cuyen means uh, moon in Mapuche, Mapudungun. And this one is Melipal. And Melipal means uh, four stars, but this name refers to the Southern Cross constellation. And in last, we have Jepun. And Jepun uh, is a name uh, uh, who refers to Venus, okay, the, uh, the Venus planet. So all, all the names of the telescopes have some relation with astronomy, of course. Okay? So, um, uh, regarding the small ones, regarding the auxiliary telescopes, okay, uh, they are very important, they are very special because um, they were specifically designed to work all together, okay? And they can change positions, they can be moved in this platform. So basically they are mobile telescopes and they can be moved using a rail system. I mean, this, this one here. So as you can see, we have this kind of rail then we have this kind of uh, stations in the ground, okay, or stations. So we have um, 30 stations and, and the, the telescopes, um, basically, as I told you, are designed to work all together as a single big telescope with a variable diameter. So the small ones will be able to reach up to 200 meters. I mean, is, uh, they are able to simulate a virtual telescope of 200 meters. Um, so you can take a look at this um, um, at this technology um, from a very short video uh, that will be that will appear in a moment uh, in, a, in a few moments. Okay. So please, Hector, can, can you please share? Okay, thank you. So this technique to combine light from several telescopes uh, is called interferometry. So we are able to observe much more specific details if you compare this with the individual telescopes. So thanks to this inter interferometry, we can simulate a giant mirror to distinguish details up to 16 times uh, fainter than a single telescope. So why don't we make uh, small telescopes and combine them to create a huge telescope? Uh, well, uh, interferometry also has limits and some information is lost during its travel. However, uh, it is still an excellent solution to observe objects too difficult to observe with our current technology. Okay, so right now we are uh, we will come back to the tool screen. Okay, so uh, okay, so we have the main platform in the screen again, okay? and right now um, uh, we will have the opportunity to visit a telescope. We are going to visit the UT3 Medipal. So we, can, we, we can't we uh, can enter all the telescopes, but don't worry about that uh, because the four ones are identical in size and shape. So the only difference are the instruments uh, inside. So you can you can know more about the instruments uh, on the ESO website, okay? So uh, Hector, uh, you have been in the platform of the Paranel Telescope, right? Can you share your opinion about this place? Yeah, I have been there. It's a very special place. Uh, 
to me, it was a combination of excitement, anxiety, but also frustration because at the time I was doing my master thesis using data from Paranal. So, okay. but, but yeah, it's a very awesome place to be. Yeah, very clear skies yeah. and the telescope are a very impressive sight to be seen for the first time, They're way bigger than you would think. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hector, for, for your comment. Yeah. 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 Sure. Of course, uh, Paranal platform uh, is um, uh, is a uh, is a very impressive site, and um, and now we have the opportunity to know more about this place. Uh, so, for all people watching this tour, uh, please um, uh, please uh, keep uh, keep in mind that you you can also visit uh, Paranal in, in person. Uh, now we we have uh, reopened. Uh, um, uh, on on site visit, so you can know more about this in the ISO website as well. Okay, so now we are going to enter UTG. Okay, so now we are going to enter to this telescope. So we are going to do right now. Okay, so right now we are in the UTG telescope. Okay, um, so as you can see, it's uh, very big. Okay, it's, um, this is this is a giant telescope. Okay, it's very impressive. So as you can see, uh, we are on the last floor of the telescope at the same height of the main mirror in front of us. So the mirror has uh, 22 tons. Okay, uh, the main mirror, the, the primary mirror, uh, with 8.2 meters of diameter and only 17 centimeters thickness. Okay, so. I am going to do a um, close up here to uh, to show you. This is the main mirror, the main mirror of um, 8.2 meters. And this mirror was created from a ceramic and flexible material. The name of this material is uh, Cerodur. Okay. okay, so how can we point to the telescope without breaking it? So I am going to um, uh, show you uh, the telescope from another perspective because right now, as I told you, we are in the last uh, floor of the telescope. But I am going to show you from this position. I am going to show you um, uh, something from this position to explain more about that. Okay, so right now we are in the first floor of the telescope. And as I told you, um, how, how can we uh, point to the, tel the telescope to the sky uh, without breaking it? So I have to show you something here, and I have to show you this kind of gray boxes right there. Can you see? So these gray boxes are very special and very important for the operations of a Paranal telescope. So basically, the gray boxes are a kind of a piston uh, called uh, actuators. This is the technical name, actuators. Okay. So. Um, and also you can see that the mirror is mounted over a white structure, okay? So all this white structure is a cell supporting all the systems uh, in this um, in, in this mirror, okay? So uh, as I told you before, uh, the gray boxes are called actuators. And the actuators are doing something very important related to a technology called active optics, okay? so. Uh, this this kind of uh, piston um, actually we have 100, 150 of them we have 150 actuators we have 100, 150 um, uh, pistons and they are controlled by a computer so they are acting on the mirror during the observations in order to keep the optimal shape of the concave mirror because the primary mirror is not a flat mirror it's a concave it's like a spoon okay so um, in this case, um, uh, we have to do that. We have to keep the optimal shape, the concave shape of the mirror, uh, because uh, otherwise it could suffer deformations just because of gravity. Okay? Those deformations imperceptible in a fifth view uh, could be critical in the result of the observations. Okay? So how is this uh, telescope working uh, during the night? We are coming back to explain that. So we are coming back to this position uh, because uh, now um, uh, I am going to explain uh, something about um, uh, 
uh, how the light is reaching the telescope. So for, for this purpose, uh, please, Hector, can you please share a short video uh, about that? So in order to explain, uh, okay, thank there you. we go, yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, we have to open the dome. We have to open the doors of the telescope in first place. Um, uh, so the light can reach the telescope, can go first to the primary mirror, then will be concentrated to the secondary mirror, and they will be reflected again to a tertiary mirror. So the light in, uh, finally will be uh, reflected to one of the three possible instruments. Uh, level up here, like uh, blue, red, and gr uh, green boxes. So this is how the telescope can receive light and can transfer this light to the instruments. It's going first to the primary mirror, secondary mirror, tertiary mirror. Um, uh, so, so basically, uh, and again, the primary mirror is concave, okay? Uh, the secondary mirror is is um, convex, okay, and the tertiary mirror is flat. Uh, so, so, so in this case, this is how the light is is going to the, the mirrors, and is finally reaching the instruments. Okay, so uh, this is uh, about the telescope uh, in, in in very simple words. Um, uh, basically, uh, during, during the day, we have to do. Uh, different things uh, during the night the telescope is observing of course but during the day um, we have people working here we have people working for example this uh, you, you can see the engineers here they are doing maintenance they are they are fixing problems they are preparing the telescope for the next observation night so so this is uh, what happens during the day in the telescope but during the night uh, no one is here uh, no one is in the telescope so um, it's, a, it's, it's a very different concept uh, if you compare this with amateur telescopes, uh, for example, because uh, in amateur observatories, uh, you, can, you can be in the telescope and you can, you can observe uh, through the telescope. But in this case, it's not the same. And no one is here during the night uh, because all the scientists uh, are working in, uh, in another building. They are working in the control building. So, Hector, do you have some opinion about this uh, area, about this telescope, if, before we move to the next uh, stop? Uh, it's an impressive mirror, impressive telescope. The mirror is one of the largest single-piece mirrors that there are. Um, do we have time for some questions for it? We have a couple of them already. Uh, yes, of course, uh, but um, we, we are going to take the questions in a, in a few moments. <laughs> so, so, so don't worry, we are going to take the questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you, uh, Hector. Um, yeah, of course, this, this place is very impressive. Um, uh, this is the most advanced uh, optical observatory on the planet. So, uh, of course, it's um, it's, it's very it's, it's very nice to be here. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so so um, now we are going to go outside because the next stop will be the control building. The control building is the workplace for astronomers and it's located here in this area. As you can see, it's in a different um, area of this mountain top. Um, I will show you this place from the opposite side here uh, because this is the workplace for astronomers uh, um, and they are working here during the night. Uh, during the day, we have engineers working here as well. So um, this will be the next stop. Uh, but of course, uh, just as, um, as Hector said, I think we have some time to um, uh, to check uh, questions. Uh, so Hector, do you have do we have some questions uh, to answer now? Yeah, we have several questions. Okay, so someone was asking about. How do we combine the light when we're doing the interferometry? Are we using like optic fiber or are we combining the signals digitally? W what is happening there, Farid? Can you tell us? Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Um, yeah, so when we combine the light for doing the interferometry, this is doing by either optic fiber or the signals are combined digitally or how are we get, getting the light for each individual telescope to get combined in the interferometry building. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, well, if you if you can, maybe you can put again the video of the interferometry, uh, because uh, in the video you 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 can see that the light, the physical light, 
is uh, reaching the, um, uh, the interferometry building. Uh, I mean, the, the building in the center of the platform, um, uh, as you can see there. And, and from that moment, yes, it's, it's converted into a digital signal. So, so finally, this um, uh, this uh, this signal will be transferred to the control building. But in in the, in the first place, the, the physical light is going to uh, reach in this place, the interferometer building, and, and after that, it will be converted into a digital signal for, to, to be transferred by uh, by fiber optics. Yeah. So uh, and maybe it's important to 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 say also that uh, uh, most of the time uh, the telescopes are working individually, not not together. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, of course they can work together, but uh, maybe around the thirty percent of all the time they can work together uh, because some projects uh, don't require uh, necessarily to work together. So most of the time they are one, they are working independently. Sometimes. Uh, we can combine two of them, and only a few times, three together, and I think uh, only two or three times in all the history of Parnell at uh, four together. But, uh, but, but uh, just to come back to the question, um, this is how the interferometry is working. All right, thanks for the explanation. Uh, another question, with too many countries being part of ISO, who decides what we observe? Oh yes, uh, actually the process to to decide about the observations is is uh, the, um, uh, okay. In order to apply for telescope time, um, an institution of uh, of an ISO member state uh, will send uh, proposals, and the proposal will the proposals will be evaluated by a scientific council of ISO. So so the proposals uh, will be approved or rejected based on on the scientific merit of, of, of the proposal so uh, actually um, uh, this is the main criteria uh, science okay so uh, even if you have uh, proposals from institutions uh, different to, to i mean not 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 coming from each member states uh, can be given consideration as well um but the, but the important uh, criteria here is science so uh, using the this uh, evaluation uh, committee or system, uh, you you can determine uh, what proposals will be approved for telescope time. And usually, uh, we are receiving here five times more proposals than we can approve. So many projects, many proposals are rejected because basically we don't have more time to offer. Uh, but this is um, this is important to know because Paranal uh, is is very let, let's say popular. <laughs> Uh, has a popular facility uh, to, to observe, so we, we have to filter uh, the best projects. Cool. Uh, we have also someone asking here whether the images are already ready to use or they have to be processed. Uh, Sorry, say, say again, please. Yeah, they're, they're asking us whether the images that are taken in panel, they need to be processed or, or if they are already ready to use for doing science. Uh, I, I can answer this one if you oh. don't mind. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, of course. Yes. Uh, all right. So when you have the images from Paranal, and they have to be distributed to the astronomers that are doing the research, they actually give you two choices. You can either have the raw data and process it yourself, but also a team of Paranal do a process of the data themselves, and you can also take that set of data. So you have both choices. You can use the data processes at Paranal, or you can process the data yourself in case you want to do something specific. And yeah, I actually have to do that for my master thesis. And part of the reason because I used the raw data was to act so I could learn how to process the data from Paranal. And it was a, a very good experience. Uh, I think we have time for just one more or no, let's continue. Oh, okay, okay, thank you, Hector. And, and don't worry because we, we can answer more questions uh, later. We have another uh, stop for, for that. Yes. Um, okay, so thank you very much. Uh, and we are going to continue now. Uh, as I told you, now I am going to show you the control building. Uh, uh, and, and for this, um, for this, I am going to rotate the view. 
and I am going to show you this place as I told you. I am going to enter here and I will show you the control bed. Okay, so basically, this is the control room. Uh, this is the main place, uh, the, the main workplace for astronomers during the night. And as you can see, this place is um, it's basically just like a big office. Okay, it's, it's, it's not um, it's, it's not so spectacular, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a big big uh, office because we have uh, several workstations. Okay, we have workstations for each telescope. Okay, so in this case, uh, this station right here is the station for the UT3 Melipad. Okay, so. Um, basically, all the operations regarding UT3 are from here. Okay, um, the opposite side we have the station for Japan, UT4. So all the operations with Japan are from here. Okay, it's a it's a specific uh, station. And now, if we work, so sorry, if we work here uh, virtually. Uh, um, I will show you the remaining uh, stations. In in this area, we have the station for UT1 and 2. So only operations with UT1 are from here. And in, in last place, if we check the opposite side, we have the station for Kuyen, the UT2 telescope. So uh, I am going to show you also a um, close up here. Uh, to understand a little bit uh, better about uh, about this, so so okay, so so basically in, in general terms, okay, um, all the telescopes, uh, tele instruments, and systems explained as before are controlled from here. Okay, so uh, during the day, engineers, technicians, and scientists are working to prepare the telescopes uh, for the next observation night. So each night we have a telescope operator and an astronomer per telescope. Okay. So for example, let let's suppose uh, this is the telescope operator and this is the astronomer. Okay. So in this case, um, uh, the telescope operator is in charge of technical details of, and the movement of the telescope. Um, it's like the pilot of the machine, and the ISO astronomer is in charge of uh, to direct the scientific observations and will decide uh, the next steps. So he will be some, uh, is, is like the co-pilot, okay? So the observations are performed by experts from uh, from ESO for scientists uh, from all the planet, okay? So this is uh, what happens here. Uh, people working uh, all night uh, in order to, to provide the best science, okay? The best, uh, uh, the best science for, for astronomy, okay? So, uh, this is uh, the explanation regarding this uh, this place. Okay, as you can see, and, and I told you already, this is just like a big office uh, to to understand uh, what happens here during, during the night. Um, but uh, all and all the people stay here working uh, all night. Okay, so, uh, so they can check uh, the pictures directly in the computer. Okay, so right now we are going to come back to the main platform. Uh, because uh, we, we finish here with the control room. And and now uh, I am going to explain something else. Um, uh, well, right now you have a lot, a lot of information about the observatory and the people working here. But now I, am, I want to invite you to know more about the main scientific milestones made from all ESO observatories. I mean, uh, La Silla, Paranal, and Chagnanto. So basically, scientific staff from different countries are using the ESO telescopes to study objects uh, near near our home, the solar system, and also others um, uh, re uh, located in, in the more distant places in our universe. So um, uh, right now, uh, we are going to explore a list of the top 10 discoveries from ESO sites so far. So please enjoy. Observations with ESO telescopes have led to many breakthroughs in astronomy and, over the years, have been responsible for some truly remarkable findings. Here is our list of ESO's top 10 astronomical discoveries so far. Astronomers using ESO's very large telescope 
have discovered by far the brightest galaxy yet found in the early universe and found strong evidence that examples of the first generation of stars lurk within it. Stars that were previously only theoretical. These massive brilliant objects were the creators of the first heavy elements in history. Elements that are necessary to forge the stars we see around us today. The planets that orbit them and life as we know it. ESO telescopes have provided definitive proof that long gamma ray bursts are linked with the climatic explosions of massive stars, therefore solving an enduring mystery. A telescope at La Silla was also able to observe the visible light from a short gamma ray burst for the first time, showing that this family of objects most likely originates from colliding neutron stars. Astronomers using ESO's HARPS instrument in 2010 discovered a planetary system containing at least five planets orbiting the Sun-like star HD 10180. They also found evidence that two other planets may be present, one of which, if confirmed, would be among the lowest mass exoplanets ever found. Newer observations and reanalysis of the data suggest that there could be even more planets around this star. ESO's very large telescope was used to detect carbon monoxide molecules in a remote galaxy seen as it was 11 billion years ago, a feat that had remained elusive for 25 years. This allowed astronomers to obtain the most precise measurement of the cosmic temperature at such a remote epoch, and it matched the temperature predicted by the Big Bang Theory. The atmosphere around a super-Earth exoplanet was analysed for the first time using the VLT. The planet, which is known as GJ1214b, was studied as it passed in front of its parent star, and some of the starlight filtered through the planet's atmosphere. The atmosphere was found to be either mostly water in the form of steam, or dominated by thick clouds or haze. Using ESO's VLT, astronomers measured the age of the oldest star known in the Milky Way. At 13.2 billion years old, the star was born in the earliest era of star formation in the universe. Uranium was also detected in a Milky Way star and used as an independent estimate of the age of the galaxy. The VLT obtained the first ever image of a planet outside our solar system. The planet, which has a mass about five times that of Jupiter, orbits a failed star, a brown dwarf, at a distance of 55 times the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. In 2014, ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, revealed remarkable details of a solar system that is forming. The images of HL Tauri were the sharpest ever made at sub-millimeter wavelengths. They show how forming planets are vacuuming up dust and gas in a protoplanetary disk. One of ESO's proudest moments came when two independent research teams, including ESO staff, arrived at a truly revolutionary finding that the cosmos is not only expanding, but that it is doing so at an increasing rate. The findings of the separate teams were based on observations of exploding stars, or supernovae, including measurements made from ESO's telescopes at La Silla and Paranal. This discovery was rewarded with the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. And finally, several of ESO's flagship telescopes were used in a 20-year study to obtain the most detailed view ever of the surroundings of the monster lurking at the heart of our galaxy, a supermassive black hole. 
Astronomy is always moving forwards, and ESO's top 10 scientific discoveries are not set in stone. Okay, uh, so this was the top 10. Very, very interesting, of course. But we have well, just one more thing. We have something like a bonus track. So let's take a look at this right now. So please, Hector, if you can share some video. Okay, thank you. So this is uh, um, regarding uh, um, something about a black hole. Uh, a team of astronomers uh, were able to capture the first image of a black hole. The Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT, its acronym, uh, it's an array of eight round based telescopes distributed on the planet, working as an international collaboration, and was able to achieve the first direct evidence of a supermassive black hole. So the picture reveals the black hole in the center of the Messier 87 galaxy. Uh, this is a massive galaxy in a closed galaxy cluster in the Virgo constellation. So this object is located 55 million of light years from Earth, and its mass is about 6,500 million times the mass of our sun. So this is the very final picture in this case. So, okay, uh, we, we hope you liked the top 10. Uh, so this was only the fraction of the discoveries thanks to the ESO telescopes and the scientific staff behind them. So now we can continue. And from the platform again, we are going to do a very special activity thanks to this virtual tour. We are going to observe the night sky from Paranal. So as you can see, right now the sky is almost completely dark with the last uh, traces of light from the twilight and the moon is below the horizon and the sky is full of stars. So here we can see um, uh, some very nice objects of the night sky from Paranal. And the first one will be a constellation actually, just above and two. So if you see, this is the uh, this is the Antu telescope. And the first area I want to show you is this constellation right here. And this is a very popular constellation called Orion. Okay. So in the mythology, this is a hunter. Okay. And in, in this case, we can see we can recognize Orion because of those three stars somewhat aligned. Um, and those stars are actually representing Orion's belt. So it's this is a very popular constellation. This is a very popular area of the sky from for, uh, for, for amateur uh, for amateur uh, astronomers uh, also. So um, something interesting here as well uh, is this object right here. This uh, this object is the Great Orion's Nebula. Um, this is also visible to the naked eye, and it's a very interesting object uh, because uh, this is also. In, in in this place we have new stars uh, in uh, uh, it's, it's like a it's like the beard place of, of new stars so so this is a very interesting area for professional astronomers uh, of course now uh, from Orion I am going to show you a different area just uh, just right here it's not uh, it's not too far away. Uh, we are talking about this star. This is the brightest star of the sky, and its name is Sidious. Okay? Sidious is the um, brightest star of the sky and also the brightest, uh, the brightest star, of course, of the Canis Major constellation. The Canis Major constellation is uh, related in the mythology to Orion because um, uh, Canis Major represent, uh, uh, represents the hunting dog of uh, Orion, the hunter. Okay? So as you can see, they are visually close uh, in the sky. Um, and this is another interesting object uh, in the sky right now. So uh, from this position, uh, I am going to show you something else. We have to go, go back to N2. And you can see that next to N2, just right here, we have another interesting object. This is an open cluster. Uh, of stars. The name of this cluster is the Pleiades. Okay? So the Pleiades is a very popular object for observers of the southern hemisphere. Um, and this, uh, this cluster belongs to the Taurus constellation. Okay? So this is another typical object uh, to, observe, uh, to observe from, from Paranal uh, in, in, th in this case. Okay, okay so um, uh, just um, something else to explain here. Basically, 
uh, regarding regarding the this sky uh, uh, right here you can see that this area has much more stars if you compare with this area or this area okay so this right here is uh, actually one of the arms of the milky way so um, so this area is um is is uh, is is more bright than, than other areas uh, of the sky, uh, but uh, actually, is this area is much more interesting during the winter in the southern hemisphere. I mean, uh, June, July, August. I mean, this this time of the, of the of the year, because you can also see the center of the Milky Way next to the constellations uh, Scorpius and Sagittarius. So this area is very interesting because you can observe more objects uh, more uh, more um, star clusters uh, stellar clusters and more nebula and, and, and so on so this is uh, very impressive to see in, in the night sky from Panna. so from here i am going to move to another location in the sky i am going to move to the south actually and i am going to show you a couple of things here I am going to show you this kind of spots in the sky. Okay, so um, these uh, spots right here are something called the Magellanic clouds. Okay, so up there is the large Magellanic cloud, and down there is the small Magellanic cloud. So they are not actually clouds, of course. They are galaxies with an irregular shape, both visible to the naked eye in a clear night like this one. So the name ref uh, refers to the records from Ferdinand Magellan during its circumnavigation of the planet during the 16th uh, century. So during this time, of course, the people were unaware about what a galaxy is. Okay. So, um, and to finish with this area of the night sky, I am going to show you the smallest constellation of the sky, the Southern Cross, right here. So as you can see at this uh, at this moment in, in this picture, the cross is tilted, okay? And, but this is an easy constellation to find in the sky, only visible in this hemisphere, and also a good guide to find the South Celestial Pole. Uh, I mean, a projection of the Earth's uh, South Pole. So during the night, the stars appear to revolve around this point, the South Celestial Pole. So in order to find this point, say, the South Celestial Point, we can actually use the, the Southern Cross. And actually we have to do something very simple. We have to extend the longer stick of the Southern Cross, I mean this one. So we have to do a projection like uh, one, two, three, four and a half. And approximately here, more or less, we have the South Celestial Pole. Okay? So, so basically, if you look at this area in the sky uh, during the night, the stars appear to revolve around this area. And also, this area indicates uh, the south uh, cardinal point. So basically, if you look at this direction in the horizon, you are looking to the south, okay, to the south um, horizon, okay. So uh, that's all. That's all the explanation about the sky. Uh, I am going to come back to the main platform, and I am going to come back in daytime because now I, I have to finish uh, the tour with the last uh, stop. I have to show you the residence of Paraná. So in order to do that, I have to change the view and move to the base camp of Paraná, right here. And I will show you in a few moments the residence, okay? So this is the, main, the base camp, the, the base camp of Paraná. And as I, uh, as I told you, I am going to show you specifically this building right here, this facility, the residence. Okay? The residence is the place um, uh, where the, all the ESO staff, I mean, astronomers, engineers, and other people with, uh, I mean, with a contract with ESO and visitor astronomers, for example, uh, they can rest uh, in, in the Paranormal Observatory. Uh, so I can, I can show you a little bit more about this place uh, because uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the workers can enjoy more humid air and, and some spe uh, specific facilities inside. So I am going to show you right now. Okay, so we are in the 
but an old residence right here. So as you can see, as I told you, it's very special. But it's a beautiful place. Um, in this area, the, uh, this is the home of the ISO staff, as I told you, during the work in the desert. Uh, they, they enjoy not only a more humid air, they also have a swimming pool, green areas, and also some kind some rest if you compare this with the desert and the sunlight from the studio. So we have, for example, a restaurant, we have uh, the lobby, we have the reception, and we have the rooms there. Uh, this residence has uh, 108 rooms, so it's a big place. Well, okay, so uh, this is the, the place for, for the ISO staff, uh, as I told you already. Okay, so I think uh, after this explanation, we are ready to answer the last questions of this tour. So Hector, do we have more questions? Uh, yeah, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one, I think you already answered already by showing the residents. They were asking us whether or not the astronomers live in a near city of Paranal or they stay at the observatory. So can you speak a bit about that? Ah uh, yes, sure, sure. Um, uh, I, I mean, you, 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 mean if the people lives uh, there, right? Yeah. If the people live, lives, okay. Well, for, for example, we have people. Um, well, well, all people working in Paranal, they are, they are working in a shift system. So, so they usually work like seven by seven, eight by six, for example. Uh, may, maybe some chips are a little bit different uh, during the pandemic, but. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, regardless of, of this, they work in a shift system. So when people works in Paranal, they spend the night in Paranal in, in this residence. Okay, or, or if they are contractors uh, in, in other rooms uh, outside. But um, when they are not working in Paranal, when they are uh, when they are not uh, working here, uh, some people lives in Antofagasta, some people lives in Santiago, for example. Some people, uh, I think, lives in La Serena. So every time they have to work uh, in Paranal, uh, they come they come to Antofagasta, for example, if the person is living in Santiago. They take a flight to Antofagasta and they take a transportation uh, from Antofagasta to Paranal. Uh, and, and the same, of course, for the people who live in Antofagasta, they take a transportation to come to, come to Paranal. So some people, as I told you, live in Antofagasta, some people live in Santiago, and, and they work under a shift system. Uh, all right, uh, we have time for a last question. They were asking us before about space telescopes. Uh, is Paranal coordinating its efforts with the James Webb telescope? Are also, with all these new space telescopes, what's the point of having ground-based telescopes? Can you say something about that? Uh, well, uh, yeah, they are not working in a specific or uh, coordination, <laughs> but uh, um, basically the James Webb Telescope is another very powerful instrument for astronomy needs. So um, uh, maybe astronomers want to observe some things with the Paranal Observatory, some things with Tololo Observatory, some things with the Keck Telescope in Hawaii, and some things with the James Webb Telescope. Uh, so in some cases, in, in, in some cases, they can decide to observe some things with the specific instruments in, in, in different telescopes. So, so, so no, they are not working in coordination, but maybe people can take advantage. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know if you want to add something. Yeah, I want to add something like for my master thesis, I have to use combined uh -huh. data from Paranal with data taken from a space telescopes like um, uh, it was from Chandra, I think I use, and also from Spitzer. And those data was not coordinated within the observatory and the space telescopes, but they just happened to observe the same galaxy that I was studying. So uh, I take advantage of that to have a uh, different views showing different things of that galaxy so I could have a um, more comprehensive study of it. So, so yeah, if you have some objects that have been observed with Paranal and then they are observed with James Webb, you can combine those data to have a better understanding. So. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, uh, do we have uh, one last question, maybe? Or, uh, I, I, you know, we have time for maybe two questions. 
All right, so the one I was asking about, does it make sense to keep constructing ground-based telescopes since we have this powerful telescope like James Webb? And I would say that yes, in part because you can repair Paranal more easily than you can repair James Webb if something goes wrong. That's just the practical reason. But also, when you want to send something in space, you cannot have like the latest technology because you have to uh, modify the technology so you can be safely sent it to the space. So there are always some compromises there. Yes, uh, of course, and, and yeah. Yeah, uh, pretty much that. And uh, I think that was the last question that we were having. Uh, and yeah, uh, someone was also mentioning that different telescopes observe different webcams, so just have to that. Yes, of course. Yeah, and you have to consider that the James Webb is uh, outside the atmosphere, so so you can take advantage of that because you don't have the atmosphere blocking a specific wavelength. So, so yeah, actually, you, it's very important and it's a good advantage to have um, a space telescope outside of the atmosphere because you don't have this problem of the atmosphere blocking or disturbing some specific wavelengths. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think okay. it would be very important so, depending on which wavelength you're observing. Yes, so of course, yes. So, okay, Hector, do, do we have more questions or, or we are ready? Uh, you, you tell me. Uh, we are ready. Uh, okay. We can start saying goodbye to everybody and thank them for having attended this tour. And I remind everybody that you can access this virtual tour and all the images in the ESO website, uh, www.iso.org. Um, Yes, and, and I also want to remind that uh, there is a survey to send your questions or comments. So maybe, Hector, if you can, you can share the link to the survey to, um, so people can send comments or questions about this too. Uh, yeah, well, now we have the, yeah. the, the links. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, I'll just, as Hector said, um, thank you very much for your presence, uh, your virtual presence during this uh, activity. Uh, I hope you like this uh, virtual experience. So please stay alert to the ISO social networks uh, to know uh, when we will have the next tour. Okay? So on behalf of ISO, I want to say thank you very much for your presence. Okay, So goodbye.